This show is brought to you by Ridley College. Okay, beam yourself in, Scotty. Oh, my ears are safe. Great. Oh, great. Well, welcome to the Now and the Not Yet show. I'm Mike the Merciful. I'm joined with Scott. I get dressed in the dark, Harrower. And this is the show where we keep you plugged into all things happening in theology, Bible, church history, and ministry in the local church. Welcome along, Scotty. Where have you been? I've been on the moon of Endor, the Ewok planet. That sounds pretty cool, pretty cool. Were you like a, a king or a god while you were there or something? Well, what do you reckon the best thing about being on the Ewok planet would be? Two things. You'd always get picked first for the basketball team. I did. And you're never short of friends to cuddle. It was, it was just wonderful, Mike. And I bring greetings from Endor to you and to all our viewers. Anyway, Scotty, what, what are we doing today, man? What have we got on the show today? Well, today we're talking about documentaries. Yep. We're talking about rulers. We're talking about Aussie theology. We're talking about lyrebirds. There's a whole lot coming up. That sounds pretty good. I'm looking forward to it. The Now and Not Yet. Hey, thanks for tuning in to The Now and Not Yet, the show that keeps you plugged in with Bible and theology. Make sure you subscribe. And hey, hang around till the very end because we've got a book giveaway for you. Today is the feast day of Constantine the Great, the famous Roman, famous Roman who became emperor, the unrivaled emperor eventually of the entire empire, and he was very important for Christianizing the Roman Empire, particularly when he had his vision, you know, in this sign conquer, the sign of the cross. Now, some people really love Constantine as one of the great Roman generals and emperors. Some people absolutely despise him because he's the one responsible for bringing in this unholy alliance between the church and empire. Uh, Scott, what's what's your view? What do you think of Constantine? You know, was was the rise of Constantine the the Christianization of the Roman Empire? Was it a good thing? What was it a bad thing? What's your thoughts? I think overall it's a good thing because one way to get to this question is to consider the alternative. So what was going on before he took over and then tried to um, bring unity amongst the Christians and then make Christianity legal and then in his wake it would become the state religion. Before Constantine, Christians were being slaughtered, um, their buildings were being taken away. I know it was sporadic, but it, it wasn't a good time for Christianity. For Christianity to develop a deep, rich culture of architecture, music, its writings, its training, and its schools, um, we really needed breathing space. And before Constantine, that breathing space was very sporadic and Christianity was getting suffocated. So it was good because it ended persecution. Absolutely. And it also allowed uh, the Western world, the Latin-speaking world especially, and a bit of the Greek-speaking world, uh, to kind of change not from just being um, pagan but then to become culturally Christian. Yeah, so I'll give you a good example. It was common for, uh, together with Egyptians and Greeks, it was common for Roman peoples to expose babies that were unwanted, that is to leave them naked at a roadside or in a forest so that they would perish or be picked up by slave owners. That gets uh, made illegal a couple of generations down the road from Constantine. I'm not sure that would have happened had Constantine not been a Christian and allowed Christianity to become legal. So that's an example of the difference that a Christian culture makes in a society. But at the same time, you've got the downside of that Christians now believe that Roman Empire and violence and its tyranny is sponsored by God because you've got a, a you know emperor claiming to be a Christian, but they're still kind of doing what the Romans do, which is blood, loot, conquest, seeking glory. And then added to that, they're also interfering in ecclesiastical matters. I mean, Constantine did try to get Arius rehabilitated uh, in, in, in the Egyptian church. So let's just go back to um, Christians participating in blood and looting and so forth. Um, it, it isn't the case that things continued as normal once the empire became Christian. Um, the games fell away. Um, a lot of violence fell away. The, the gladiatorial games. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, um, Christians didn't just continue to participate in things as they had been. I think there was a cultural change. You're right about the interference of the state in church matters. This is where I play the providence card, um, which is, I would say, that under God's hand, in just the right time, Constantine popped up. And fortunately, he helped resolve this terrible heresy to do with 
the divinity of Christ and the Trinity. So, I mean, I see God's hand behind it, even though it was a less than perfect process because it involved people. Yep. Now, one thing I've noticed is that Constantine can get a pretty hard rap. I mean, there's a big sort of anti-Constantine. I've heard people say we need to de-Constantinize the church, you know, get away from our unhealthy allegiance or chaplaincy with empire. We need to extricate ourselves from the empires of the world, whether that's, you know, the, the British or the American or, or whatever it is. And people say we need to be the sort of the prophet on the margins of society. We need to, we don't need to be the power. We need to speak truth to power. Yeah. But the problem I have with that view is let's say you're the prophet on the margins and you're speaking truth to power. What happens when the power listens? Yeah, I know. That's right. Then well, what do you do then? And you say, okay, prophet, we repent. We're gonna we're gonna end slavery. We're going to um, you know bring in universal health care. We're gonna yeah. you know have a basic minimum wage. Mm. We're gonna look after the poor. And in fact, we like your ideas so much. I want you to be my deputy. Or could you please choose someone or recommend someone yeah, to or, be my deputy? Or, or could or you run a center for human rights at the local university? Yes. Or you know, we'll give you money to run a charity. Yeah, you know, exactly. So you can do so. This is the thing. I, th I think some degree of Constantine, some alliance between church and state uh, is inevitable and, and I would even say is kind of necessary. Now, we have a slightly different arrangement today. We have, a, we have secularism. Mm. Um, and, I mean, the first thing you have to say is secularism is not one thing. It's like 13 different yeah, things. different kinds of that The secularism of France is different to Turkey, which is different to London, which is different to America. We have different arrangements between church and state. Um, in, in 30 seconds, can you tell us what is the best arrangement between church and state, Scott? The best arrangement would be one that allows the kingdom of God to flourish. And by that, I mean that every single human being would have access to the Christian faith, the Bible, and everything that is necessary to flourish according to a basic human hierarchy of needs. But what is necessary to flourish includes the Christian faith. So Stephen Lehman has an excellent model for this. Uh, it's his kingdom of God theology, where state and kingdom uh, meet, and uh, I'd recommend you to follow that up. Thanks, Scott. That was good. Good. However, the correct answer was Queen Elizabeth II. <laughs> Long live the Queen! Don't look at me like that, Wayne. I see that face. <laughs> William. William will be the new Constantine. A well-mannered... Yeah, but we, we get Charles first. No, we don't. It's going to skip Charles. I'm speaking truth to power. Skip Charles, I think please. you're wishing. <laughs> Give us William, but not yeah. Harry... No, Not Harry. Ha no Harry and Meghan. <laughs> Give us George, the boy king. Yeah, maybe a boy king. Yeah. And if, if they, maybe they needed some sort of regent who could look after him and direct him <laughs> in his ways. Kind of uh, like, a, like a, a Richard III kind of character. Exactly. Who could, <laughs> who could nurture him into manhood and teach him how to reign and rule. I mean, I would, I would teach the British. I, I, would, I, I would treat the British people kindly. For now and not yet. And now, Mike, I want to pivot to talk about Aussie theology. Welcome to Australia. <laughs> so these days we're into global theology, right? So I know yep. that on your courses you recommend some books from global theology. Yep. What are, what are some examples of that? Oh, well, there's a number I like. Uh, in the United States, there's Asian-American theologian Amos Young. Right. He's got a great book on global theology. That's terrific. Uh, one little book I love as well is Simon Chan's Grassroots Asian Theology. That's a terrific one. From Africa, there's uh, Matthew Michaels, his book on Christian theology done by an African Catholic priest. Mm. So yeah, there's, there's a number of really good books out there that I tend to recommend to my students to get some global perspectives as we work through various topics and issues. So we often draw on American or English or South African authors, um, but have you ever wondered what is it that Aussies bring to the table? Ah, oh, probably lots of Vegemite, <laughs> possibly some Hugh Jackman, I don't know, maybe some Nicole Kidman. Uh, well, what do we bring to the theological table? So I'll, I'll give you an example. My wife, she reckons that what we bring to the table is really good biblical theology. Having travelled the world together, and she's also studied at Ridley College, she's noticed that Aussies are really good at working, finding themes within biblical books 
and noting the continuity and discontinuity between themes in the Old Testament and the New based on the incarnation and the mission of the Spirit. So for her, what Aussies offer the world is biblical theology. Section. What, what section? There is no one section. It's just the vibe of the thing for the world. Yeah, I think there is a long tradition of good biblical theology in Australia. You've certainly got, you know, Graham Goldsworthy and the sort of species of biblical theology around him. Uh, Moore College has been a big powerhouse of biblical theology with many of the faculty we've had there. Uh, even our own principal, uh, Brian Rosner, mm. he edited uh, one of the, you know, definitive textbooks on biblical theology. Yeah. I think it's the IVP's New Dictionary of Biblical Theology. Yes, yeah, so there is, there is an Australian tradition of biblical theology, which is based on, you know, largely how do you connect the old and the new together. Yeah. And that's, you know, and I think there's the famous Graham Goldsworthy definition of the kingdom of God, which is God's rule over God's people in God's place. Yes. So some of these things have really caught on. And I think, yeah, there is a, a, bi a big biblical theology tradition in the Australian context. The other thing is I think Australians have is we tend to be more likely to push back on authorities. Yeah. Now, that can be uh, all sorts of you know ways that can work out. It means we have a, maybe a natural inclination to, towards heresy, like <laughs> just because Athanasius said it doesn't mean I'm believing it. You know, we can be a bit like that, but also means we're willing to test and question some of the reigning theses and paradigms yeah. around. It's just, look, I don't care with your titles, you know, most reverend professor of the highly sonnets of the supreme Shakespearean righteousness yeah. or whatever you call yourself. Um, I still think you're full of nonsense. It's all part of it. This is what I'm getting at. That's my point. It's the, it's the vibe of it. Yeah. I mean, Australians tend to be uh, a, a bit like that. I think Australians also tend to be more egalitarian. Yeah in their yeah. own ways, yeah. probably probably more so than both the British mm. and certainly more than the uh, Americans as well. Mm. And that does work itself out into certain sort of church cultures and types of theology as well. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I'd like to talk about something that I reckon we bring to the table and uh, I call it liebird theology. Li the liebird is a funny Aussie uh, bird. My uh, family, my wife's family... Is it funnier than me? Uh, well, I'm I mean, humour is something we bring to the table. <laughs> you are a bird and you are funny looking. Um, so the lyre bird is an Aussie bird. You can look it up on um, YouTube, whose brilliant trick is it can incorporate all the sounds that it hears around it into its song. So there's a wonderful YouTube clip by Attenborough where he follows a lyre bird and they take a photo of it and the lyre bird includes the click of the camera in its song. He also, in his attempt to outsing his rivals, incorporates other sounds that he hears in the forest. That was a camera shutter. And so, here's what I reckon. Aussies are really good at listening to what's going around and including it together and weaving a new song. And by that I mean, Aussies are great at listening to the losses and the laments in life. Because every summer, we're on fire. <laughs> Right? Literally, we, not, we, not, we, we not got, on fire for Jesus. I mean, no, literally. No, no, no. You know, on on fire. fire. Literally burning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We yeah. have lots of social problems that we don't hide away from, like, so, like uh, domestic violence and drug abuse and all that. So we're very aware of that. We can't ignore it. But we're also aware of what God is doing in the now and the not yet. And I think that what Aussie theologians are good at is actually drawing both together. And I call that lyre bird theology. And with some friends, we've just launched a book series with Whiff and Stock, New Studies in Trauma and Theology, and we have the lyre bird as our symbol. And our statement is that the whole series is to be done a la lyre bird theology. And, you know, the idea came to me at Ridley College. you know why? Because there was a lyre bird outside your office? Well, close. Ridley's next to the zoo. What do you reckon, yes. what do you reckon that means? Uh, well, it means I can hear the monkeys in the afternoon yelling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of monkey noise at Ridley. A lot of yeah, monkey exactly. noise. Yeah. yeah, can come from the common like dining area, but also it comes from the zoo. And I was teaching history just last semester, and I heard all the monkeys howling, and I thought a lyre bird could be doing that. So I thought of lyre bird theology. So what what I've gleaned is basically lyre birds are people who violate copyright and rip off other people's stuff, or <laughs> oh, no. or you know, or they're very, very eclectic. They're very good at absorbing and synthesizing other materials and then making their own music out of it. 
Thank you very much. Let's go with the second one. Let's Noticing the consequences of the fall and the consequences of the kingdom of God together. Let's go with that as an Aussie contribution to world global theology. Yeah, well, if your theology ain't liarbird theology, then maybe it ain't theology. But now and not yet. Let's talk about trauma and theology, Mike. Let's do that. There are basically three different approaches to how you might relate trauma and theology to one another. Okay. And together with uh, Preston Hill, uh, Joshua Cocaine, and Shelley Stearns, we've, we've thought about a paradigm that we call Dawn of Sunday as the best paradigm to relate theology and trauma. Let me, let me explain how it works. Yep. Let's take the Passion Weekend. Good Friday, Jesus suffers. It's all like torture, death, terrible stuff. Holy Saturday, he's dead and entombed. And then Resurrection Sunday. Christians try to bring the theology of, for example, Friday, Jesus' suffering and passion to bear on the traumas that we might experience and what that means for recovery. And they might emphasize basically that the way that God relates to trauma is he just understands our suffering. So that's one model, right? That's yep. the Friday model. The Saturday model is Jesus has descended into this middle space between life and death where those who have and are experiencing trauma live in a weird in-between place between life and death. Your life is sort of not what it was, it's not what it will be. You're living an ambiguous suffering life and, and maybe there's a hint of resurrection. But both the Friday people and the Saturday people don't really want to talk about spirit, resurrection, hope. They, they, want, to, they want to make sure that we do the right thing by trauma studies and talk about the traumatic and the, the disruptive nature of trauma, right? Yep. Now, you have other people, though, that want to talk about the other end of the weekend, which is Sunday. And some people, especially evangelicals, want to talk about full-blown Sunday, victory after trauma, new life. I haven't just um, survived traumatic experiences. I'm, I'm all new and I'm all better, 100%. But... As my friends and I look at this, um, we've come up with this dawn of Sunday idea that really theologically and psychologically, when you draw the psychological science with the theology, where we sit is, as Christians, at the dawn of Sunday. We're still living with the trauma, the open wound, the storm of what's happened. So that we've still got one leg in Saturday. But we've also begun to live at the very beginning of Sunday. We're experiencing resurrection, new identity in Christ, union with him, and the beginning of virtues in safety in the Christian community. So that's the dawn of Sunday paradigm. Um, I just wanted to ask you, what do you reckon of that paradigm? Well, it sounds good because uh, my initial reflection would be the, the danger of having like an un under underrealized theology of hope and healing where you're kind of stuck in Friday yeah. and you're unable to kind of burst through the, the terror of death and suffering and trauma. But then again, you don't want to do the, the over-realized eschatology, like, oh, I'm fully healed, I'm fully better, I have all the hope in the world, everything is fine and dandy, because, that, because you, know, you may have some lingering pain and suffering and issues you haven't fully worked through yet, mm. and then you're telling yourself that everything's good. So, I mean, that does, that does sound good because you're kind of working through uh, the experience, you're processing it, but there, there is some kind of hope there as well, but you're not saying, ah, oh, everything's great, everything's fine, you are living as this show is named in the now, and the not yet. Yeah, very good. So it's a now and not yet theology brought to bear on human suffering and trauma in conversation with psychology. So what um, Josh Cocaine, Preston Hill and I have done is that we've written a new book called Dawn of Sunday, The Trinity and Trauma Safe Churches. So we're thinking about how God's Trinitarian work of giving us safety after trauma is played out in our lives and where the church fits into this. So the final three chapters of the book is what does it mean that the church is what we're called into by the Trinity after trauma? Yeah, and we've, we've discussed that with a number of denominational leaders, both um, here in Australia and in the States. And we're trying to really apply this now and not yet theology to Christian communities in the wake of trauma. Okay, that sounds very proper. Heart of the press. 
now time to look at some books we've been reading and reviewing. Now, I've been reading a book by my Ridley colleague, John Dixon, which is on bullies and saints. You get some great stuff in this book. I mean, you get the the good, the bad, and the ugly Mm. of church history. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get some really good stuff like uh, the great things Christians have have done, you know, establishing hospitals and care for the poor, the abolishment of slavery. But then you get all the ugly stuff too, kind of what happens when the church is co-opted by empire. You get like, you know, the the massacres that happened during the Crusades and that kind of a thing. And I I would recommend this book. I mean, you can read it, but I would also recommend it as an audio book. Okay. I, th- I think it's a really good audio book because it's read by John Dixon himself. Oh, that's great. And he, he does have a pretty good voice. He does kind of have like a, a, a NPR voice. It's not kind of like, hello, I am John Dixon. And today in Blues, you know, it's much better than that. He really reads stuff well and it's very exciting. Definitely one I would recommend to people who are history buffs or want to know the good, the bad and the ugly of church history. Mm. All right. Well, I've got a couple of new books, which are fantastic. I'll just put my gloves on because they're hot off the press. Here we go. Let's go. Whoa. Oh, touchdown. And they're hot. They're very hot. And they deal with hot issues. Oof. Okay. First one, David Bauer, The Gospel of the Son of God. This is a very ambitious book. He wants to say these days everyone's interpreting Matthew or any other biblical book, the way that they want from trauma perspective or their cultural background, whatever. But he wants to say, hey, guys, let's just stop a minute. Can we come up at, and this this is his words, a consensual exegesis, that is a kind of approach to the Bible that treats the Bible in a way that it deserves to be treated for interpretation that we can all agree on. That's ambitious, isn't it? That is. That is, yeah. Yeah. But it could be good if you can find, because Matthew has been one of the most like ecumenical books. Everyone loves Matthew, you know, Christians of all types, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox. Everyone loves Matthew. So if you can find a consensual way for reading Matthew, it's going to be a plus. Yeah, that's right. So it's been the most popular gospel going way back, right? Oh, indeed. So he wants to say, okay, how do we interpret text wisely and he uses Matthew as his example. And it basically has um, a a section on how to interpret the Bible, then what Matthew is saying, so what's done in Matthew, and then he wants to have a theological section at the end, which is what's done by Matthew. So he wants to have the theological claims follow on from the exegetical claims. This is a great book for anyone interested in Matthew itself, but also in interpreting Matthew and how to do the right thing by both the church, the original authors, and speaking into culture today. So it's a really important book. So I highly recommend it for um, students, pastors, and for exegetical courses. Then we have this other excellent book called Christobiography. Um, Craig Keen has been one of the leaders over, I reckon, what, 20 years since his work on Matthew in terms of um, thinking about Gospels as biography, hasn't he? Uh, Gospels as biography, history, memory, theology. I mean, he's spent a lot of time investing in the Gospels. He's a, he's a great scholar, a lovely Christian man too, lovely yeah, Christian is, man. He? he really is. He's yeah. such, such a gentle soul. So basically what he does in this book is he says, if we go back to um, the way that biographies were written in Jesus' time, we see that they are historical works that are focused on the character. However, there is some kind of um, development of what they said to make sense of the character and the portrayal. But there are lots of safeguards around how these Gospels are written as biographies, and that has to do with memory studies because there are communities that remember Jesus around the composers of these biographies of Jesus. So he does some excellent uh, work that I really appreciated to do with biographies in the empire. But then as he moves on um, towards the end of his study, he he concludes that um, a historical and sensitive approach to the Gospels will read them as biographies with a number of qualifiers in place, which he then uh, lists out very helpfully. So if you're interested in the Gospels as history, not hagiography, not fake news, I guess, 
Um, this is a very important work for you. And what's really great is he synthesizes so much material to do with memory studies, to do with historical bias, to do with historicity. It's, it's excellent. I can't recommend it enough. It's a chunky book, so it's kind of um, reading perhaps between semesters, but it will repay, I reckon, for your whole theological career. It's an excellent, excellent book. Yeah, it's, and all Aquinas' book are a massive condensation of primary and secondary sources. Yeah, absolutely. It's Definitely. excellent. Yeah, anything by Craig Keane is always worth reading. Mm, you know what's also worth reading is his two-volume work on miracles. Yes. Yep, you can also go see a uh, YouTube clip he's done, a kind of summary yeah. of a lecture he's given on miracles. That's also very good if you want the digested version. Yeah, so if you're teaching a class on apologetics, which I do at Ridley, I use his work on miracles. Um, it, it's very well documented scientifically and historically and from the experience of, of many, many people. Um, just brilliant. So I, I recommend that too. Yeah, take that, David Hume. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> The now and not yet. Survival tips for Bible College. One thing we do at Ridley College is not just teach, we mentor students. We want to see them grow spiritually. We want them to develop study skills, you know, basic living skills, relationship skills, grow in their knowledge of God and, and their love for others, be better equipped to be ministers in the church, on the mission field, in, in parachurch ministries, or even, even just more competent in various aspects of their daily life, from, you know, theological knowledge to, you know, even through to things like emotional intelligence. Mm. But sometimes you have to give students some tough love, or you have to give them some tough advice. And yeah, you know, there's some students you've got to tell them to get back into the books, knuckle down. And you know, one thing I, I tell students they need, if they're going to be successful at anything in life, they need a bit of discipline. Yeah, And discipline. What, we have what's called Mikey's Maxim, which is do what you have to do before you do what you want to do. Yes. Okay, like I know you want to binge watch Netflix for a while, mm. but first, you know, read a few chapters of a book or, you know, get that essay done. Then you can go out for pizza with friends. So, and, and the other thing I tell them to do is always do the hardest thing first, you know, or as we call it in my house, eat the frog. Just shut up and eat the frog, get it over and done with. Eat the frog, I like that. Yeah, because if you don't eat the frog, then as we say in my house, you've got a frog's chance in a blender. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, eat the frog or you've got a frog's chance in a blender. Do the hard thing first, get it out of the way, and then you'll be successful. What about you? What amphorisms, what, what wisdom and wise sayings do you have for your mentorees, Scott? Well, my uh, primary piece of advice, Mike, um, would be for students to integrate their learning with their worship life. So, for example, if you're studying a course with me on the Trinity, you're going to deep dive into some deep stuff to do with Trinitarian relations, Trinitarian persons, Trinitarian missions in the world. All good, important stuff. However, what I will also rec recommend alongside that technical theology are also works by great Christians who have worshipped God, taking into account his Trinitarian nature. So Richard of St. Victor, for example, highlights the fact that God being three magnifies his worship worthiness because it shows us the perfection of his love, his goodness, his wisdom, and so forth. So I really like the synthesis between the technical and the, the worship aspect of who we are. That means that our students won't compartmentalize their experience and worship as Christians and their knowledge on the other hand. They will be those great, beautiful, knowing, wise worshipers that we're after. That's exactly right. That should be the goal of our instruction, to synthesize the spiritual and the academic together yes. so they feed in rather than compete or get siloed from mm. each other. That sounds, like a, that sounds like very good advice. I like the, ch I like the survival chances of that in a blender. I'll give that like at least four out of ten chance of survival. Four frogs out of ten. Four frogs out of ten. Okay. But now and not yet. So thanks for being with us. We've had a great time. All the best. Catch you in the next episode. And it's time to beam you out, Scotty. Okay, here I go, buddy. I'm ready. Hey there. Before you go away, don't forget we have a weekly book giveaway contest. 
If you subscribe and leave a comment and follow the information below, you could be in the chance to win a free copy of The Trinity Without Hierarchy, edited by myself and Scott Harrower. Enter so you don't miss out. The Now and Not Yet, the show that keeps you plugged into everything Bible and theology.